Stephen Mansfield, New York Times bestselling author and speaker. Doug Tenapel, I'm the creator of Earthworm Jim. Tweet Groups. I'm Victor Dweck. Joseph Carter, I'm the Mink Man. This is Dave Baker from Forged and Fire. This is Liam Morgan. I'm a comedian, and this is why you should never, 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 don't ever, not ever. Don't waste your time. Oh, you really should. For listening to those darling yummy. Reverend and the Reprobate. Hey, everybody. Welcome to The Reverend and the Reprobate. I am Lucas Pinkert. I'll be playing the part of the Reverend today. And with me across the table is a guy whose mom never taught him how to press the record button. It's uh, Dan Lee. I'm sorry I didn't do that, Gibson. Yeah. The Reprobate. We don't have a center cam for some of the episode today. Yeah, but our audience wouldn't know that unless we told them because they'll well, see it at the beginning. Just, you just said it. See it. No, I alluded to the fact that you didn't do something, which our audience wouldn't be surprised at. <laughs> <laughs> Lucas, Danley, what's the difference between Noam, <laughs> Noam Chomsky? Chomsky. Um, today on the show, we have uh, our, our friend Stephen Kent, who is the author of How the Force Can Fix the World. Um, he's also good friends with uh, the ladies, <laughs> the ladies, the the dad and the two sons over at Tatooine Sons. Oh, those ladies. <laughs> oh, those, ladies. Always, those ladies those are always ladies stealing over, our bits. The ladies and gentlemen over at Tatooine Sons. Um, thanks to uh, to David Jesse for uh, putting us in touch with Stephen. Oh, yeah. Stephen's awesome. We, you guys are going to love him. Yeah, the the I'm the sorry episode, for no center cam. This the episode is centered around um, some basic virtues that he talks about in the book that are very prevalent in the Star Wars series and that are things that as children that we knew that we held on to that we saw were important and as adults we've kind of strayed away from them. He talks specifically about humility, empathy, um, the need for redemption, how we can overcome fear, and all the things we learn about in the Star Wars series. Uh, and and talks to him about how we can can practically yeah take he makes those a things. good he makes a great case for episode one being a good story and a good he, movie he does and he talks about free range parenting uh, which Cheetos are the best mm-hmm. what uh, Lincoln Park album Thrawn would use in order to get inside his head to be able to mm-hmm. strategically outwit him all that stuff on this episode of the Reverend and the Reprobate make sure you like subscribe go uh, on, ding the little bell and to hit get the notifications like go ahead and give us five stars go ahead and you know, whatever you're watching go ahead and do it. Because you can always undo it. Yeah, you can always undo it. Stephen Kent. Danley Gibson on our airwaves today. We are joined with probably one of the most accomplished, um, I think, not just voices that we have, but he's younger than us, which means that I kind of hate him because he's done so much stuff with his (laughs) life that we'll never do. Um, uh, A journalist, political commentator, and the author of How the Force Can Fix the World. It's the host of the Beltway Banthas. It is the wonderful, fabulous, the very talented Stephen Kent. How are you, sir? I'm doing very well. That is uh, my favorite introduction I've ever received. Thank you. Well, ab- you're, you're welcome. Absolutely. Yeah. It, and the wonderful part about it is I did that a great it's, job. it's all true. <laughs> and I, th- I think that's. Uh, like Don't either- say that. Don't say that about yourself. You've got a wonderful, wonderful setup here for this podcast. I'm looking at your awesome camera yeah. setup, your table. Thank and you. And here I am in my basement, and it's a disaster. Well, so, you. Uh, Everybody you. has to has to start somewhere. Thank you, and, and uh, I accept that compliment. Yeah, shut up. <laughs> it's all it's all him, right? Yes, it is. It is. So, uh, I, man, I I really don't know where hey, to start. Hold there's on, so it much is. Stuff it to is. Get but into. I'm I'm more charming and handsome. Go this ahead. is true. Go ahead. There there's so much stuff to get into um, with with the book, with the work that you do on the podcast, not just with Beltway Panthers, but also with Right Now, uh, mm-hmm. with Rightly, the YouTube show that you host. There's so many avenues that we could go, but I, I really want to focus in on the book because I've spent the last couple of weeks going through it and reading it, and I think the idea of using Star Wars as a premise to bridge the gap between political and personal ideologies is is phenomenal, and, and you really talk about that in the intro of the book. You say that Star Wars is a lifestyle. Star Wars is is a philosophy, and that's one of the things that you are aiming to get the reader to understand in your book. How is it that you came about this conclusion, and and how do you think that Star Wars as a lifestyle philosophy can help to change the world? All right. So first of all, I have a question to begin. Which yes. one of you is the reverend, and which one of you is the reprobate? Wait. If you had to guess, what do you think? Um, Lucas is the the reprobate. <laughs> oh, oh man, that is that is the exact opposite. Nope. I I am the reverend. <laughs> I am the reverend. Yep. All, all right, right. All right. I, well, I put, am, but but very mouth. close. I am a Sith. <laughs> okay. Okay. All right. Full all Sith. good. You're know. you're more of a gray Jedi than a Sith because you can't That's go true. full dark side. That's true. Yeah, your child would be too disappointed in you. 
your child that you're not supposed to have since you've made unnecessary emotional attachments. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, but uh, to answer answer your completely fair and imbalanced question, uh, you know, how do you come to the conclusion that Star Wars is something of a philosophy and way you order your life? I mean, it's just sort of when you start drawing on that source material and citing that text when you're running into a problem in your life or you're having a conversation with your child that you just don't know really how to have and you need to get your kid to like learn how to throw the ball better and you always go back to uh, do or do not, there is no try like star wars is this this story with so many great lines points of view philosophies that george lucas and i suppose disney at this point have just sort of like all hammered into these these stories to put together a star wars view of the world right and there's sort of these threads that go throughout all of the different trilogies that give it i think a a narrative sense of what these movies are about uh, avoiding excess, self-control, good intentions do not always lead to good outcomes. These things are consistent throughout all of Star Wars um, up to this point, which is in its credit, right? Um, but this is something that I've come to, and I'm a Christian myself, but like, I've never been a very good bookish Christian. Uh, you know, I've, I've always gone to church. My sister is a touring Christian musician and artist. She tours the country with her husband and her three amazing kids. Um, and she is the kind of person who, if you need some help, she can give you the, the verse and the chapter. <laughs> and I'm like, that's really great. I wish that was me. All I can do is tell you which Star Wars to watch. Um, <laughs> You know, and that's that's kind of how I, I think about this and why I wanted to write this book. A little bit of political science and a little bit of self help. I I can relate to that. I am curious. I've never heard bookish Christian. How, how would you? How would if you were to define that? What what is that? What is a bookish Christian? <laughs> a good Christian, uh, someone who actually knows the Bible. Um, I mean, that's that's kind of what I what I'm referencing there is just the kind of Christian that I always have wanted to be and have just never woken up and seen that person in the mirror. It's my mom. It's my sister. It's these people who can give you the verse, the chapter, exactly what page you need to turn to, to find the advice that you need for your problem or the thing that you're going through. It, it was all uh, the for, Bible. For me, drill it's always been pop up. culture, yeah. right? It's been comic books. <laughs> yeah. It's been star Wars movies. It's been this and that, but it's, that's kind of for me what that, that means when I say bookish Christian. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. I mean, Danley was busy beating up Bible drill kids, and and here Stephen is talking about how that is what the bookish Christian is yep. like. So no, I, I understand <laughs> the now. exact children you picked on were it. the ones that, I got it. Yeah. that he's giving us. Not a scold, of. you know, not the person who's hitting you over the head with the book, but right. the person who really knows it. Nerds. Uh, so <laughs> I admire I admire that kind of person. I just I one day hope to be that person. I, I figure I still have time. Well, I, I, I think that is a good point, you know, to your to your point of there are universal truths in Star Wars that you can't apply to real to the real life, to the real world, like the Jedi uh, find, you know, meditating and finding the inner peace and um, and not not attacking. Those are those are things that you can teach your children. You know, you can use Star Wars as a as a in real life. You, you can, I, I know it's not a great point, but it's you, not, you can use it to fix the world, which is what yeah. he posits. What he posits in his book. Well, as soon as the book was turned into the publisher, it became fixed. So there are no problems in the world left to Done. solve. Oh, I'm, wow. I'm very, very happy to announce that. So we and did it, guys. There you go. <laughs> and, and in October, you can purchase your copy of the book and solve all the problems in, in your world. Yeah, um, no, absolutely. So you've got several chapters in the book. Um, I, I think I've got seven or eight that are written down here. And you go through each chapter is given a title, but it's also given kind of a, a characteristic that is associated with it. Uh, redemption, balance, choice, humility, empathy. And you go through some things that are, are very important. It's, it's really a list of virtues that not only that Star Wars talks about, but also that are things that each one of us can identify within our own our own tribes and and how they're used and oftentimes how they're out of balance whenever we're interacting with people that either don't hold the same values or or that disagree with us and I I want to start off with where you start the book with and that's with humility and I love the example that you use about Princess Amidala and I want to know 
yeah. based on the way that that our social media algorithms have kind of turned us inward as far as we only get to see the things that we want to see. Um, how is it that adopting sort of Princess Amidala's example can help reorient us away from a, a me-centric or a, a universe that's just kind of surrounded around my feelings, preferences, and thoughts? Yeah, so I, I am absolutely an episode one apologist. I look at that movie all the time and I find something else new in it that I am excited about. And one of the things that I came to believe just a couple of years ago is that the most profound message of episode one is a message of leadership styles. And it's the one that we see enacted by Queen Amidala, uh, also known as Padme, uh, in that film as she is trying to figure out how to deal with the droid invasion uh, by the Trade Federation, which has pretty much split the planet of Naboo in two, forced the Gungans underwater and forced the queen off world. Um, this is sort of the chapter where I ended up inadvertently making the case for child monarchies, <laughs> which, was, <laughs> which was not exactly what I, I had gone into plan. But, you know, what I learned in sort of studying the Naboo case was that Padme, and it's not apparent on screen, but she is 14 years old when this whole situation unfolds on, uh, on her planet of Naboo. She is 14 years old the right sovereign queen, the elected queen by the people for Naboo to lead. Uh, and then her predecessor and uh, whoever came after her successor, they were also teenagers. Their youngest queen on Naboo uh, was as young as seven years old. And they don't do this as like a means of uh, hereditary monarchy where people are just sort of endowed with the crown by time they are born. Uh, they are elected <laughs> by the people. They literally just elect these people to lead. And it's a, a masterclass sort of study in why they would do this. And it is about humility. It is about children having curious minds, not being set in their ways, wanting to learn and knowing when they need help. And Padme throughout the, the episode one chapter, she is able to display knowing throughout the film that she needs help from outside sources to deal with this problem. And if you look at that just sort of on the surface, you go, okay, well, that's just a character with her back up against the wall. But not everybody behaves that way when their back up is up against the wall. Not everybody behaves as if they need to go out and seek knowledge from people that they've never spoken to before to solve problems. So I ended up kind of making a larger point about the virtue of children, their curiosity and how they might approach the world if and when you actually were to give them political power. Because I'm a little frustrated with, uh, I don't know, folks our age being so set in our ways and conditioned, I think, by social media to believe that we are always right and don't need help from others. You uh, So yep. actually, on your latest episode of Right Now, um, I, I, I forget the, the lady's name that was on. Um, mm -hmm. You may have to help me with her name. But she made a case for, you know, for the generational warfare that we find ourselves in with. Uh, with Trump, oh, yeah, Hannah Cox, Hannah mm -hmm. Cox, uh, with Trump and Biden both being over 70 years old and the boomers largely in control. So how would we adopt a Naboo uh, <laughs> template? Well, for well, we would. Well, we would. Right. I mean, we can't we can't embrace child monarchies as an option. Take, take, take uh, the monarchy out of it. But how would how would we get younger <laughs> blood into politics? Well, I mean, younger blood into politics, I think that that's a question of incentives. I think that's a question of our political system actually being accommodating to younger people. Uh, it is not a field where one, you make a lot of money. Uh, I know that there's sort of this belief that people go into Congress and then they get rich. That is not the case. Most people who are elected to, to office in Washington, D.C. are already independently wealthy. And then there's a small sliver of them that then sort of make bank peddling their influence after they are out of office. But it's really hard to actually go and be a lawmaker and pay your bills. Um, the youngest lawmakers in my home state of Raleigh, North Carolina, 
uh, 36 and 37 years old, one Democrat and one Republican. And they have both united in that state to go and do speeches together, talking about why you actually need to raise the pay of lawmakers. And nobody wants to hear this. Yeah, yeah, yeah nobody, nobody wants to hear this. But I, I always remember my first internship in the legislature and my mentor told me, uh, do you want to run or asked me if you, I wanted to run. I said, yes. And he told me just please don't do it until you've had a successful career and you've got money in the bank. When people don't have money in the bank, that's when they get themselves in trouble. And to me, that is just always sort of stuck in my mind, um, as one of those pieces of evidence that being a public servant is not really lucrative. Uh, and there are things that we could do to try and incentivize it. That's not a Star Wars lesson. That's my personal Politico opinion. Um, but there is wisdom in youth, right? There is wisdom in our children. They see the world in more untainted ways. They're curious. And one of the things that the, the Naboo do to actually counter this is they surround every queen and a couple of kings, but mostly it's been queens on the planet of Naboo, with a royal advisory council. And this is where they actually listen to elders who have experience in government, uh, longevity, sort of working the reins of Naboo, uh, and then also giving them advice. Now, maybe some of them are snakes in the grass. Maybe some of them are manipulative and have their own agendas. But I make the case that Padme is sort of a good example of when Jesus is talking to his disciples and he tells them to go out and maybe you can correct me on this, Lucas, uh, but not be like sheeps or doves, but to actually be as aware and um, um, aware of sinners, right. As, as a snake would be like to be really on your toes. Um, yep. There's sort of a, a counterbalance here between being really, really cunning and being somewhat innocent and naive in your approach to people. And that's tough. Yeah, it's uh, the the line Jesus says is that we. Should I know be, what it is. Yeah, go ahead. You first. It, innocent as doves and shrewd as vipers. Whenever we go out into the world, um, I I'm glad that you you hit on that because in a, especially in the chapter on humility, you really walk this line between being um, Star Wars oriented and talking about the Naboo and and specifically Queen Amidala, and then using Christ as the ultimate example of humility. How difficult was it throughout? you know these chapters where you're talking about specific virtues to not consistently go back and forth between star wars and biblical references and use them to complement each other rather than allowing one of them to to really take or control the narrative oh, that that was hard i think for for instance i mean i only really draw drawn sort of christian theology in three chapters mm -hmm. uh, particularly like the free will chapter the the stories on redemption and then the chapter on humility, because I thought that those were the most effective for those specific moments. But one of the things that this book is about is that the world, and particularly the West, United States, is coming apart. The way in which we have always been able to understand our neighbors, understand our sort of shared heritage and shared belief system, that's coming apart. And a huge part of that is Christianity. And even beyond Christianity, just membership in a house of worship, whether or not you are a, a Jew or Muslim or Christian, right? Just being committed to a faith. This is in rapid decline. The fastest growing religious group in this country are atheists, uh, people who do not believe. This is the, the cohort with the fastest, knowing, fastest growing numbers. Um, and it takes away something that we're all able to talk about and sort of share our moral compass as being like starting at the same place in theory. And so what I wanted to do was draw on different faiths, theologies, ideas, philosophies, and then all tie them into Star Wars where it made the most sense. So humility was something where I just was talking to my sister and I was talking to her about the issue of humility. And she brought up those chapters where Jesus is talking to his disciples about having the minds of children to be great followers of Christ. And he's not calling on them to be dumb. He's calling on them to be open because you can't find your way to Christ or to any savior of any faith unless you think you need saved, right? Unless you actually think you need something and you're not all powerful and all knowing already. Um, and so this is sort of the thing that Padme has to do in episode one 
is not go through the democratic process of the republic to solve this trade embargo and invasion by the trade federation, but to go to the enemies of the Naboo, the Gungans who live underneath the sea were ousted by the human population to live underneath the sea decades earlier, uh, and they don't have a good relationship. And she takes a knee before the Gungans and asks for their help because she knows she needs it. That's powerful to me. That 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 is effective for tying together those different strands. You know, you're making a good case to not hate episode one. <laughs> I got I to gotta admit. Good, there's good I've, stuff I've, throughout. I've, I've spent a long time... <laughs> Uh, you know, originally watching it and the pod races, I really enjoyed that. Yep. Um, you know, there's uh, the the fight with Darth Maul. Oh, man. There, there's some redeemable things at oh, face so value beautiful. that that I liked about it. But yeah, that, that, that's a good point. There is a lot of good. Uh, do you think that Jerry Nadler would be boss Nass in the in the in the remake? <laughs> he certainly could be. I think so, too. <laughs> <laughs> that's it <laughs> that's it that's it that's the tweet I, I just keep thinking of Naboo of Naboo moving into politics and Jerry Nadler popped in my head Jerry I Nadler just see him going blah, 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 blah. <laughs> that's a, a rousing endorsement yeah, yeah I, you know what I think that's going to be really great is micro content just you doing that. that'll be our next TikTok Uh-oh. video <laughs> um, go ahead so you go talked, with a smart question. Yeah, you, you've talked on your podcast and, and you spend an entire chapter in your book talking about um, empathy and how important empathy is and how far away as a culture and individuals we've come from being empathetic towards people that have differing opinions than us. We're very empathetic towards people that we feel like are on our team or that share the same Mm -hmm. uh, values, but people that differ from us, we have a, a really difficult time being empathetic. And one of the ways that you draw comparisons on this to Star Wars is talking about the masks that people wear. So I'm curious as to to how empathy can fix the world and and why it is that our masks prevent us from becoming empathetic towards people. Well, masks exist to either hide something from people who might be looking at you, right? You put on a mask to conceal your identity or to hide something about your, you know, your identity that you don't like about yourself. Sometimes people wear masks to, you know, protect themselves from what they might see in the mirror, something that they are wanting to run from. Uh, And sometimes people put on masks just as a sheer means of survival. So like personas, right? I think we live in a time period and this is sort of a a result of the internet and social media where we are all wearing masks of some kind, right? We are putting on our faces for the public. We are presenting ourselves in a certain neat and tidy way. I I kind of compare it to like throwing on Instagram filters to all of our photos and all that stuff. I think everybody intuitively knows that whether or not you have an avatar for your Steam account playing video games or you go by a, a fake name on Twitter we're all kind of creating ways in which we can hide from one another. That makes it a lot harder for us to relate to one another and to also see people who might not agree with us as people. It's one thing to argue with someone on Twitter with like a blue check mark. Their name is Stephen Kent or something as if I would have a blue check mark. I don't. And you know who they are. You can see their face. You can see they're a human being. Maybe they talk about their family on their Twitter account, stuff like that. Versus arguing with somebody who's just like their Twitter handle is NDC54 and their their avatar handle is just like a droid photo. Like, and you're duking it out with this person. How are you supposed to feel anything for their feelings? How are you supposed to care about the way in which you talk to them when the them is not really a person? Um, I think this is pretty much one of the major problems that we're, we're fostering in our society right now, whether it is echo chambers and the different places where we get our information to just how we live in the online world. It's one Follow of us the, at at Rev and Rep Podcast. Yes, yeah, there you go. I, th- I think this is one of the big, good point. the big things that social media has caused is interconnected as the world has become, mm-hmm. right? We've also created this big distance that, it, you know, these are the, the conversations that sniper used to shots happen. From, yeah. from a distance to a... a some like like you said, someone with a handle, right? So there's there are conversations that used to happen, you know, in in our tribes, right? As yep. you know, indigenous people around the campfire, 
there are <laughs> there are conversations that used to happen in our places of worship where people um, wrestled with different parts of their faith or where you know these small communities uh, I, I believe uh, just a couple of months ago Russell Brand and and Ben Shapiro were talking about this exact thing that these communities oh, yes. of 150 people would live next to each other and they had these differing values and ways that they want their children educated or whatever, but they sort of left each other alone. And however, like the, on big things, they would have sporting events where, you know, like lacrosse was the tribes, the native American tribes coming together to play. Well, these would be the times where they would talk about those things before and after the games and, and that kind of stuff. Well, we've gotten so far away from that because now we don't have to deal with it. Mm -hmm. And so because there's not this face to face interaction, we have the opportunity to, to dehumanize one another and and one of the things that has happened is because or because of this dehumanization is now we have the ability to play off of one another's fears. And this is another one of of the chapters in in Stephen's book. It's called The Darkness Loves Your Good Intentions, which I think might have been one of my my favorite ones where he he describes this character and let me see if I can uh, if I can quote it exactly here uh, there are creatures that understand every fear that you have <laughs> and the gift of speaking to your uncertainty and those are of course politicians <laughs> so you you paint a pretty scary picture of politicians and how is it as as people that we can look at as what is a very accurate albeit kind of terrifying description of a politician how is it that we can still put our trust in you know politicians in the system and and learn to overcome fear Hmm. Well, you have to believe in the system that they're actually representing your interests when they go to Washington or your state legislature to supposedly represent you. I think that that's really tough. Um, but, you know, one of the, I guess, related points, you know, right. So like in a representative democracy, uh, you have, right, like uh, AOC coming from Brooklyn to represent a, a specific house district in uh, in her town, right, in her city. And it's just kind of striking to me that she is like a, a, a national lightning rod, that we all have to have an opinion about this person who's representing one narrow Brooklyn district uh, in New York City. Did you see and, her dress at the Met? Oh, my God. The <laughs> dress. The dress. I, I've tried I've tried to stay off the dress court, the, the dress discourse and on the mask discourse for all of their servants but, at the Met Gala. Yeah. That is, that has been something I've, <laughs> I've tried to keep my focus on throughout. Mm -hmm. um, but no, I mean, like we sort of have this consumer based individualized culture, which guys, I'm a libertarian. I, I have been for many years. I feel comfortable in that in that sort of skin politically. But there's a real trade off to this idea of like the market knows best and everybody can sort of have a society or entertainment and a politics that is catered just for them rather than a thing that we share. And I think one of those obvious pitfalls is everybody is just able to sort of pick the information they want, pick the entertainment that they want, pick the circles that they're going to run in and never hear from authentic people on the other side unless they really go out of their way for it. Um, the chapter on empathy that you mentioned, it's about masks. It's about different heroes in Star Wars, Luke and Rey, eventually having to grapple with the fact that there is a human being underneath the mask of their opponent, Kylo Ren or Darth Vader. Luke is first faced with that realization, not when he learns that he's his father, but when he has the vision on Dagobah fighting Darth Vader in the cave, and then he cops, lops off his head, and then it breaks open and he sees himself underneath it, calling him to realize for the first time so far in the story that he too could be someone just like Darth Vader. He too could end up in that suit if he's not careful. Rey kind of has the, the same sort of realization in The Force Awakens when she chides Kylo as being a monster. And his response to that is to, or she calls him a creature in a mask. And his response is to pop the mask off, slam it down on the ground, and then just stare at her eye to eye. And she sort of is taken aback. You can see her fluttering a little bit. Maybe she really thought he was cute, or she was just a little bit disturbed by the whole process. But she was like, oh my God, this is a person. This is just a boy. And he's like, no older than me. What does that mean? Um, I just, I wish we all had more experiences like that with political opponents, with people who scare us. Um, 
I mean, don't you ever wonder like who some of these people underneath the masks and garb and black block and Antifa are like, I really want to know because I certainly against some of my best instincts can demonize people and be like, yeah, these people are like scum of the earth. Never want to know them. Never want to know them. And I probably do. They're probably someone who <laughs> they probably are people who like go to your same, uh, same restaurants or like hang out in the same downtown as you do. They're your neighbors. It's kind of freakish, but it's something we need to grapple with. And, and there is always hope, you know, uh, you know, Saul in the Bible is a good example of that. Tell us more. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm trying to figure out which he, Saul you're talking about. Like King Saul, or are you talking about Paul? I'm talking about, well, he changed his name, right? Y- yes. Yep, yep. Yeah. Saul, Saul to Paul. Yes. Yeah, Saul to Paul, okay. that he, he persecuted and killed Christians, and then ended up being redeemed and, and finding a, you know, a new torch to carry one for, for God, one for light. And he that, wasn't canceled. He, he was yeah, not he, canceled. He was given the chance to, to, you know, he became the champion essentially of, of the early Christians. He, he was given the opportunity for, for redemption. Well done. How, how was that? That, that's a good segue into chapter five, redemption or Man, reckoning. <laughs> I am handsome and smart. <laughs> <laughs> so the the chapter on fear, I've, I've got one other question specifically about that, is in that chapter, you talk about this memory of an icy text message that you got from a neighbor. I want to know this too. And, <laughs> and you don't tell us what the text message is. Now, I'm curious about the whole story, but I want to know, what was the text that your neighbor sent to you when your daughter asked if his kids could come play? It was something along the lines of, and this is like suburban passive aggression, right? Would really appreciate it next time if you would let me know before your child rings the doorbell. And it was like one of those just curt written in a polite way, period at the end sort of text. And you you read it and you're like, okay, are you pissed? Like, what is this? Uh, yeah, so no, that was the text message. And uh, I did find it offensive. And I've been mad about it for years. Is it, was it a mom or a dad? It, it, it was a mom. Yeah, it sounds like a mom note. See, well, this... I got some of those, this too. This goes back... I don't know if you're familiar with uh, a friend of our show, Kira Davis, who is the editor at Large at Red State. And, oh, and cool. Kira has talked about, you know, that exact kind of thing happening is that her, her kid um, one time went to the wrong door, rang the doorbell, and they had a ring doorbell, and the family was like, uh, don't know if you guys have seen this suspicious-looking young lady of color that's going around checking in people's houses, looking in the windows. And then all of a sudden, that became a big deal and a dangerous situation for her child to be in because now her picture's all over the internet. And this whole idea that what was very normal for us, which was run down the street, and you know, you had two or three yeah. kids that you know were yeah. on the road, you go and you knock on the door. My you, son does that all the time. Yeah, you just patiently wait there for somebody to answer, and you come up with the, you know, can, th- can Daly come out and play? Yeah. And the yeah. mom's like, no, he didn't do the dishes. He's like, yeah. oh, crap. Well, now I got to go to my next best friend who's a few yeah. houses down. And you kind of go through that whole thing, realizing that that's something that we no longer have in society, I, I think is really difficult. So, how do we build, you know, this, this road to, not just hope with one another, redemption with one another. And and really on the, the topic of redemption, you've talked in your podcast and you talk in the book how redemption is kind of a, a Western idea because it it is oftentimes perpetuated from these Judeo-Christian philosophies and that the worldview that a lot of people um, come out of, it is said to be built upon three things. You have to deal with, with creation, whether you're constructing an atheistic uh, or a religious worldview. You have to deal with why there is evil in the world. And, and the final thing is you have to understand how a person can personally be redeemed. And you either have to ignore that redemption exists in the world, or you have to figure out how it is that a person can achieve redemption. And how does Star Wars teach us about redemption? And, and why is redemption an important thing for us to um, not just try to achieve, but also to allow others to be able to achieve? So to the the first point, part of the question you were kind of tying together the the loop on the you know the kids playing outside yeah, he and being long questions yeah <laughs> roam roam their neighborhood I, I just wanted to speak to that i mean the answer and particularly the star wars answer is stop being such a control freak um you know by and large the fear narrative and the dark side narrative throughout star wars is all about people 
not being willing to embrace not having control of all things at all times. And the the phenomenon of kids not being able to roam their neighborhoods, uh, go knock on doors freely in the average neighborhood, this is not the case everywhere, of course, um, but particularly in suburban neighborhoods and in cities. It's because people are one of two things, either terrified of mystical serial killers, which are not really around every single corner and waiting to snatch up your child, but we're terrified of it regardless because our media establishment tells us to be. Uh, And then the second thing, which is really, I just think very busy lifestyles where because we are such busy people as Americans in 2021, we just sort of want to have our hands around our kids' schedules at all times uh, and have a little bit more control over everything, part of being a workaholic culture. Um, Star Wars is constantly telling us to let go, to let, let go of everything you fear to lose, let go of your uncertainties and accept things that might be coming your way. You have a bad dream, accept it. Don't try to get out ahead of it and just, I don't know, like do whatever needs to be done to stop that dream from being realized, Anakin. Um, <laughs> <laughs> this is this is what Star Wars is telling us. And, and it's not just telling that us that in the context of the history in which those movies were made, it's telling us that to apply it to other areas of our life. Um, Star Wars draws on Stoicism and Buddhism and this idea of making peace with the things in which you don't really have control. Um, I can't get the, the quote right off the top of my head, but it was the Stoic Epictetus who said that a life well lived um, is a life in which you've been able to separate the things that you can control from the things in which you can't and you focus on the things that you can and the things that you can control are in here always in here. Um, And we've just created, I think, a pandemonium style culture in which we are afraid all the time of new things because we have not listened to this kind of advice. I wanted to answer the question about fear, and I've kind of now gotten uh, led aside from your question on redemption. Would you mind offering me that up one more time so I can speak to it? Yeah, I'll, I'll see if I can do it with a little bit more brevity, because as Danley points out every episode, my questions do tend to, <laughs> tend, tend to borderline on, great the, on the 90 don't, to 120 don't, seconds. Don't, don't stop. They're great questions. So with, with redemption, um, the, the thing that you've talked about both in the podcast and in your book is that uh, redemption tends to be a very Western idea. Yes. Mm-hmm. Idea. And that one of the things with redemption is that we want the ability to write our own redemption story, but we often don't extend to people that have different philosophies and ideologies the opportunity yeah. for them to write a redemption story on their own, or, or we don't allow them the opportunity to be redeemed. Why is redemption such an important thing for us to to learn or, or to, to begin to work towards. Because, because of the empathy problem that we have in society at large, at some point you are going to be Darth Vader to somebody. Uh, you are going to be the person who they only see a cartoon, a villain, someone who they cannot relate to. It might be your child at some point, right? Like George Lucas talked many times about how he put his father into Darth Vader when he was writing that character and sort of letting out from his discourse as a son on that character. So the reason that we need redemption is because we're all going to be in that position and we're all going to need um, grace from people in our lives at some point for things that we either did do or things that we were perceived to do. Um, And those are complicated problems to try and solve. Um, One of the things that you had mentioned about redemption kind of being like a Western construct, I think that that is is largely true. You know, there's the idea in Judaism and, and, you know, sort of the idea of of the word redeem means to like pay a debt, right? So you've actually like run up a tab, you've run up a bar bill, and you actually have to pay it. And maybe you can't pay it. So the guy next to you redeems your debt by paying your entire tab for you. You didn't deserve it. It's just something that they did to pay the thing for you. 
in Eastern philosophies, so kind of like going over to Hinduism and Buddhism, there is not this construct of, of sin. There's not this construct of the Ten Commandments and the things that you don't do to dishonor God. There is light and darkness. There is the dark part of humanity, which is inherent. It is the devil, right? And then there is our angelic side, our side that is called toward better and higher things. Um, those, those belief systems lead you to make peace between Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, to actually have those things both recognize one another as valid and to accept them and then conquer them, right? You want to conquer your dark side and own it before it owns you. And I think one of the things that we do in, in Western life and, and in Christian life, and I believe it is a higher calling to suppress some of our darkness, like to not recognize it as being equal, but to actually actively try to say no to it. Um, that is the calling, I think, of a Christian, at least. And it's very, very different fundamentally from what Yoda learns in the Clone Wars about conquering his own shadow so that he can achieve eternal life after death, which I suppose we can talk about sort of the fundamentals of, of force ghosting here. Yeah. Yeah. Which is um, that I don't think that the way that they portrayed Anakin in Return of the Jedi after 2004 is an appropriate way to show a Force ghost because it should as, still as be a teenage teenage It should still be old Anakin. Yeah, I agree. <laughs> it should no, still be old Anakin. no, 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 no. <laughs> <laughs> the prequels, the prequels are my Star Wars. I don't know. I don't know how old y'all are. I'm a uh, 1989. We're so. 85 models. So okay. we're we're just a, just, a few years just, older than you. We're the just, same age just as like Brian, Brian Stelter. Stelter. Oh God, Brian <laughs> Stelter! He looks like he's fifty. We did, I know. we discovered that today that we actually yeah, he was born two months before and I was born two months after. So Brian Stelter is the Oreo, and right. then I yeah. and then I poured a stiff drink. <laughs> Yikes! Yeah, we Yikes. we couldn't believe it. Yeah, so no, the prequel the prequels were my coming of age Star Wars movies. I was gotcha. I was really young when the the nineteen ninety six re releases on VHS came out. Um, so the prequels were like my Star Wars. And so when, when Hayden Christensen has worked in there at the end of Return of the Jedi, I go, yes, oh, that's man. for me. Uh, mm. But I, I totally understand why that rubs people the wrong way. I mean, to be to be fair, to be I, fair, I, I don't really care. Yeah. Well, there you go. Everybody cares a little <laughs> there bit. You go. There you go. I, I'd, I'd prefer the old, you know, because that makes the most sense to me that Darth Vader lived past being a very handsome 20 something. Yeah. We we don't yeah, see Yeah, but young Anakin Yoda. Skywalker died on Mustafar. And I think that for the the spiritual aspect of Star Wars, um death of the self is part of Sith and Jedi philosophy. Now, it might just be sort of like this Sith cultish part of their religion, right? Where they they say Anakin Skywalker is dead. You are now Darth Vader. They are being quite serious when they talk about that, the idea of dying to the self. Um, and spiritually, if you take the Sith at their word that they didn't make this philosophy up out of thin air, that it comes from something, Anakin Skywalker died on Mustafar, spiritually dead. Um, I think it still makes sense for him to reappear at that moment and at that age. But there, there is an element of it that is hokey, right? Because Obi-Wan yeah. is old. <laughs> yeah. Obi-Wan is old. O Yoda is old. And then Anakin's a 20-something-year-old. A, a well, well, and at, that looks odd. Well, at, at the end of, of Return of the Jedi, who would he have been then? Because he seems to reject being Darth Vader and throws the Emperor, you know, betrays the Emperor, mm -hmm. turns back to good. So who would he be at that point? Yeah, that's a, that's a great and fair question. And that is a return to Anakin Skywalker. That is like he does return to being Anakin at that moment. Um, old so Anakin. Yeah, yeah, and he is old. It's a completely fair argument to make. I'm just sort of laying that explanation flag out yeah. there. Okay, but if that's um, what we're going to yeah. do, and he's old Anakin as the Force Ghost, then why does he have arms and legs at the end of Return of the Jedi? <laughs> the only way to really make him to where he stands well, with the others. Are you going to be like the genie just floating in the air with yeah, I mean, he dust? Would, he would need to. Um, other, other, they'd have a, have a special Force Ghost chair for him to be in. You know, it's, <laughs> there was, I well, think that, that would be kind of a bummer if Qui-Gon <laughs> Jinn, like as a Force Ghost, had a big hole hole in yeah. his chest, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah go because for it. It's a follow-up on something you mentioned. Uh -oh. You mentioned uh, the creation, yeah. right? Uh, do we know, because I'm asking out of out of ignorance, do we know the creation story of Star Wars? Oh, yeah. What's the uh, what's the creation story in Star Wars? 
the Do, creation as long story as it's, of Star Wars. Yeah, as long like as it's not midi chlorians, I'm gonna no, I'm well, gonna lose it if it's midi chlorians. So so we were talking earlier. I mentioned in my my lengthier version of, oh, of okay. the question yeah. on redemption that that every worldview oh, has to contend yeah. with three things. It has yep. has to contend with um, how things were created. Uh, why evil exists in the world, and then whether or not there is a form of redemption, and if there is, how you mm. achieve that. So, what is is there a a creation story yeah. in in Star Wars? It doesn't include midi chlorians because I will lose so, it. <laughs> so, yeah, this is this is me going like completely off the cuff because there has not, to my knowledge, been been anything staked out on this yet. But the Force, as Yoda describes it, connects all living things. It surrounds us, binds us, ties the galaxy together. And so if the force not only has a plan, but a will, the force is like this, this powerful force that has a a will for the things that are going to happen in the galaxy. I think it is completely reasonable to say that life itself was born of the force, the first midi chlorians, the, co- the like the microorganisms that pop up in the galaxy and start forming planets and worlds like we might understand it in some of our, you know, scientific texts about how frogs became man and all that kind of stuff. Like, I think that it all comes down to the force, just being this energy and then having a will to, to design and build. But I don't know. They've never really unpacked that. They cool. They have it. So my my last question, as it concerns as it concerns the book, because we want to be very book centric, um, but not is, not bookish. Is there are there are a couple of of areas where Nobody. you talk about the the balance between you know uh, anger and hope, and how do we yeah. return the scales to order when it comes to to anger and hope? And I think that there are two characters within Star Wars that we've we've seen that do a really great job of that. One of them um, you see only in the show rebels and it is the character Ben do who is a very like a oh, yeah. character um, who helps out uh, Kanan through several different um, through a couple of different seasons, but through several different stages of his growth as yeah. a character and as a person. The other one I think, and you mentioned this a couple of times in the book is, is Qui-Gon Jinn. And how do you think it is that, that Qui-Gon sort of has adopted um, as a as a character and as personal virtues and integrity something that seems to both kind of supersede the flaws of the Jedi Order, but also at the same time has prevented him from turning to the dark side? Well, he's not a political person. He is a Jedi. He cares about preserving and walking in the light side of the Force and the exact reason that he's like not on the Jedi Council as articulated by Obi-Wan in episode one uh, is because he just doesn't like follow the council's orders and listen to them about the way they want to do things. The Jedi are Republic housekeepers. They are not a enlightened uh, monastery of monks who are committed fully to practicing the light side of the force and understanding it. They are emissaries of the Republic. They originally, like in the High Republic era, uh, about 100, 200 years before we ever see episode one, they were used by the Republic to chart unknown reaches of the galaxy, bring order and civilization, kind of like Knights Templar. Uh, And then by the time we see them in the films, they're enforcers of the regime. And the trick for all Jedi in this period of time, the Clone Wars, is realizing that, that they thought they were joining this order to learn the ways of the light, but they are really here to preserve a a system of government. And that is not what Count Dooku signed up for. Count Dooku, I think, is a really interesting example because he ends up with the Sith, but he kind of ends up with the Sith as like sort of a marriage of convenience. He's done with the Republic. He's done with the Jedi being the supporters of the Republic, and he's interested in seeing a a status change, a regime change in how the galaxy is governed. And I think the Sith for him are like the logical partner to do that. Um, But then he wants to dismantle the Sith as well. He tries to get Obi-Wan to do that. He tries to get Anakin to do that, uh, and he fails, and then he ends up dying. Um, But he was Qui-Gon's master, and Qui-Gon learned a lot from him, I think, including his skepticism toward the politics of the Order. One of those one like slightly unanswered questions throughout the prequels that I want more information on, there's some good books that I might pick up, but 
Yeah. Qui-Gon is, Qui-Gon is the way, is uh, practice your beliefs and step aside from politics. I think that's a, that's a really intelligent thing to do, especially um, if you're the one that's going to go find the chosen one and, and win him from Watto during a pod race. <laughs> um, I, uh, Van Steven, I've, I've really appreciated the time. Uh, we want to um, definitely promote the book, which uh, you can find How the Force Can Fix the World. Make sure that you pick up a copy of it. But before we let Steven go, we want to enter into our favorite segment of our show, which is called Controlled Rowdiness. We're just going to ask you some rapid fire questions. You answer them to the best of your ability. Um, okay. There are no right answers, but there are several wrong ones. Well, I I heard that you are a fan of Dune. I'm a new fan of Dune. A new fan. I, I am too. Actually, my my sister got married this this past summer, and I got the chance to to take some time and read the book on, on a porch. Yeah. It was fantastic. But uh, I'm three quarters of the way through the book now. I'm trying to get I'm trying to get through it in time for the new movie. Okay. Well, luckily for this question, you don't you don't need full knowledge of the book. So, uh, in cool. in the book, there's so much great science fiction characters. There's the gom jab the gom jabber, right? Which which you have you have read at this point. It's right at, right at the beginning. Um, Baron Harkonnen, Lady Jessica, Duke Leto, Paul Atreides, yep. and why will my wife just see the movie for Jason Momoa? <laughs> um, because uh, she knows what she's about. So yeah, there you go. Um, our, I mean, he is super hot. Like, there's no arguing. It's uh, it's remarkable how self aware they are of his hotness because he's front and center in all of yeah. oh the, yeah all yeah. of the trailers. It's like Momoa, 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 and I imagine he's only going to be like a tenth of the movie. But yeah, I'm if, not. I'm not. That. No spoilers. But his character is not. You know integral to yeah. to the to the story. Not integral. Total no. background character. You, you yeah. say no spoilers, but the books are sixty years old. I'm just saying. I'm like not, he hasn't finished it. But so my, my concern is is for our guest. Okay. He's taking care of me. That's yeah. that's for, for Dr. Kent. So uh, are you a free-range parent? Uh, I aspire to be every day. I let my kid out of my sight as much as I can. But I, I, don't, I don't subscribe specifically to like that very specific sort of lifestyle choice that some people make in the libertarian movement. Um, yeah. I wish I lived in like a place where that could be done better um just like our living situation i try to send her out and just like out of my side as much as possible though so yeah so libertarian right yes uh mm -hmm. does ross ulbrich deserve to have his sentence commuted yes we, we agree we agree yeah. <laughs> Ab absolutely com and completely uh which dark side force power do you wish that you could have it's lightning sorry uh. <laughs> I mean, it's lightning it's it's kind of a combination of just like i always loved palpatine growing up he was my favorite character and then also my uh, my love of Dragon Ball Z, oh, and I just yeah. always I just always wanted to shoot power out of my hands, yeah, uh, okay. to destroy my enemies. So uh, it has to be lightning. What, what are the top three? So we got lightning and number one. Where are the next two? Well, then there's Force Choke. Um, they also have the ability to crawl inside your mind and and invade your thoughts, uh, and then also drain your life essence uh, is a good. A good one. I'm not really interested in draining people's life essence. That, that's what I would choose. Like a definitely Capri into Sun. electricity, force choke, uh, and then mind reading. That sounds like fun. So I I sometimes simulate the lightning as I'll get my hands wet, and when my cat's around me, I'll just flick water at her, and it feels <laughs> it feels a lot of the same. I get I get, really, I get a really similar a, reaction. A Sith Lord. <laughs> <laughs> that's yours. Oh, I thought I asked the last one. Uh, what piece of art would Thrawn use to learn about you? Probably what the piece of art would Thrawn? <laughs> um, probably uh, the cover of Hybrid Theory um, by Lincoln Park. Um, I have that framed in my house. And that is probably the most important piece of music that I have on my wall. And... All you need to know about me can be tied back to my uh, my new metal days. So. Oh wow! I also love Hybrid Theory. Was that was that, that's that's was my high school. I yeah, mean, we're, that was a good that, album. That's what I listened to. It, it's still... that in Creed. I know, oh. and I know, but I know. <laughs> You're not but, supposed man. to tell us that. Yeah, well, it's the truth. 
And you've, I, I but love, you've stuck with I Tremonti. I love me Mark, some Mark Tremonti. Yep. The truth will set you free. Yeah. Uh, which Star Wars heroine is the real hero? Leia, Padme, or Jen Erso? Jen Erso. Oh. Why, why do you say that? Because she gave it yeah, all in the end, and she did so selflessly and with a smile on her face. Um, really great ending to Rogue One. Uh, that's I guess that's all I'll say since this is rapid fire. Yeah, I'm I'm excited to see the uh, the series of did, did series Princess Leia. That. What what real role did she play in in resolving anything major? Ben Solo. Well, I guess the the serious answer to that would be uh, she was the the chief person next to Mon Mothma rebuilding the New Republic after the fall of the Empire. Um, so she helps put together the constitution for the new world order, the new galactic order. Uh, but that's the stuff that we don't see on screen. And it mm. is also what helps lead to the demise of her marriage with Han. So, you know, you give some, you lose some. Uh, what color lightsaber would you have if you were a, a Jedi? I would have purple. Yay. Yeah. Very nice. Can, can you have red and be a Jedi? Uh, yeah, so there was a, a Jedi, one of the women on the council who in one of the old, old, old Star Wars games um, had a red lightsaber and I thought it was super cool. But the answer, the answer is no, because what you have to do to get a, a red lightsaber crystal, you don't go to a cave and just pluck a red crystal out of a wall. You do do that for... Uh, for blue, green, and uh, the purple one, which is just much more rare. So I, the only reason my weight Mace Windu has that. The red lightsaber crystal is unnatural. You have to torment the crystal to actually make it turn red. It's called bleeding the crystal. And so what the Sith do, because the midi chlorians and every lightsaber crystal are alive like midi chlorians are living things and so they compose these crystals um they basically use the force on the crystal and they pour their anger their pain everything they hate into the crystal until the crystal breaks inside until they've broken the spirit of the force oh, <laughs> in man. the crystal and then it bleeds. And that's what they call it. They're bleeding the crystal. So you have to torture something, basically, to get a red lightsaber, um, which is cool. I, I learned that a couple of months ago reading some of the new comics. And I was like, OK, I'm with you. That's, this so, is that's neat. So, so ultimately, a Jedi wouldn't be able to have a red right. one unless they found it or something. Unless they found it or yeah. picked it up off a of body. Yeah. So mm -hmm. why, does it, why are Ahsoka's new lightsabers white? I have no idea. <laughs> That's what I want to figure out. They look super cool. I have no answer for that question. Yeah, they, they, do, look, they do look super cool. All right. How, uh, go ahead. How do you forge an ice? <laughs> it's a terrible it's a question. question from our producer. With an ice tray. Yeah. Hey, there we go. We got a legit answer with an ice tray. Um, all right. Last question. Cheetos, crunchy, puffy, or flaming? Uh, crunchy. There you go. That's the only correct answer. That's it. All right. Uh, Puffy are for sodomites. <laughs> <laughs> Stephen, thank you so much for the time. Can you, uh, can you tell our audience where it is that they can find you on social media and how it is that they can get a hold of the book? Yeah, uh, you can follow me on Twitter at Stephen underscore Kent 89. That's Stephen with a PH underscore Kent 89. My political talk show is on YouTube. You can go to youtube.com slash rightly aj that's slash rightly aj and my book is how the force can fix the world lessons on life liberty and happiness from a galaxy far far away comes out here in just a couple of weeks would love it if you'd pick up a copy we'll have links to all of that stuff in the show notes steven thanks so much for coming on the show man we really appreciate it this was a lot of fun the reverend and the reprobate thank you for having me yeah yeah man thanks for coming steven freaking kent steven no, kent what, what we gotta, a, we gotta what use a phenomenal the guest what a guy with a just a great mind and and i think when i introduced him that i was being really accurate by saying that i i am a little uh jelly jelly of him <laughs> yeah for sure i mean the guy's done don't, a ton don't of be stuff jelly, he's uh 
he he said he was born in 89, which means he's much younger than I thought he was. Um, to be four years younger than us and to have accomplished so much more just makes me want to fly to D.C. and punch him in the nose. <laughs> um, no, he was uh, he's a great guest. The book, um, How the Force Can Fix the World, is is amazing. I thought I, it was I really insightful. It. Um, I loved hearing about it. Yeah, you loved it, as we discussed, it, yeah. I didn't I didn't read it. But I really loved the comparisons of what's going you know, again, it, he made a good case for episode one. Right. Like, there's there's some there's some redeemable qualities in a movie that I had previously dismissed for the most part, aside from like we talked about, the lightsaber duel with, with Darth Maul was the best one. Oh my gosh. Yeah. It's it's absolutely incredible. And the the pod races, especially for a yeah. young for a young Loved guy. It. I had the game on I had the game on Nintendo sixty four. Oh, it was so great. With Sebulba where you can you can uh, vent your you can use your vents to, you know, shoot people off. Right. And then uh, Mars Go was one of my other favorites. Um, I I thought was a ton of fun to to get to play as that character, and then you I could use Sebulba every upgrade single time. the pods and and all of that stuff. It, using Sebulba's uh, pod is the same as using Odd Job on Goldeneye. It's not it's fair. it's a cheat, <laughs> yeah. yeah. But it was it was a ton of fun, uh, not just playing the games, but getting to talk to him about you know the way that Star Wars has influenced not just pop culture, but in a lot of ways politics. And we didn't talk to him about this in the episode, but we do see it often mentioned in his book is that one of the ways in which politicians across the aisle use Star Wars really as a way to to bring people together on the same topic is they will describe a common enemy as, you know, we realize you're not the Galactic Empire. These people are the Galactic Empire. We have to band together, you know, or else we're going to lose to you know, the enemy Mm -hmm. and they use star Wars as a way to help one another understand who a common enemy might be or to, to describe, you know, the other side is we need you to, I don't don't need you to be Qui-Gon right now. I need you to be Obi-Wan. And we see all these really weird things that happen in politics where they're using star Wars as a way to bridge the gap. And I did think that there was an interesting point that Stephen made is that, you know, it used to be that our our religious affiliations were able to do that, that we had this common set of core values that we upheld. And so therefore we could say, you know what, we, we're both coming, even though we have some things that we disagree on, we're both coming together as Christians. And so we have these, you know, common core set of values that we're we're both observing. We're going to be mutually respectful of one another. We we want to make sure that we do the best thing for the people that we're representing and on and on. And as that has diminished, as the world has become a lot more atheistic, Stevens kind of discovered this sweet spot in that Star Wars, even though it is, uh, you know, as the guys on Tatooine Sons would, would describe it, uh, the mythology of today, mm-hmm. it it has that ability right now. We can all relate to Star yeah, Wars. Yeah, to, to kind of create that, that sort of shared value system. Even as, Jerry Nadler. <laughs> which is just such a cheap shot of uh, of Jerry Nadler. If, if Boss Nass's pants were a little higher. <laughs> <laughs> so I want to know, Danley, uh, what was your favorite chapter in the book after we you heard our discussion about uh, it? Humility. Yeah? Yeah. Why? I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> I Look, I think an apology is in order. For... Not for not reading the book. Yeah, I, n- I never said that I would. You're always never reading the book. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But, <laughs> but there have been a string of mishaps, which I think just got cut out of the beginning. Maybe, potentially. Uh, so I'm sorry for almost breaking the TV. Yeah. <laughs> For not turning on the center cam for most of this episode, and for unplugging the camera to charge my phone for the on the previous episode. Well, I I accept your apology, and and I'm exercising humility. Yeah, and I'm going to be empathetic, and allow you the opportunity to redeem yourself. Yeah. Um, and I am going to hope that things will be better in the future, and that you will make choices that restore balance to our show. I think we hit every chapter except for uh, here we go. I fear that that might not be the case. <laughs> <laughs> Great! Hey everybody, thanks for watching the Reverend and the Rubber Bait. Make sure that you like, subscribe, ding the little bell, um, so that you can get notifications and, when new episodes and come also, out. And also, one last apology, Colton. Yeah. I said your question was stupid. I love it. 
Okay. Uh, I'm, I'm getting a signal from Colton give telling us, us a, to uh, Give us a, a five-star review or just a regular review on iTunes or, or, or I say iTunes, Apple Podcasts or Podchaser. Look, look, it doesn't cost you anything. Give us five stars, right? Yeah, there you I'm go. asking you to we, you get to pay a buck per star. Just give us five. Yeah. We'd really appreciate it. It also helps us to get great guests like Steve and Kenton because when they go and look at the show, they see that we've got high reviews and doesn't give them incentive to want to come on and to help out. Thanks you guys for listening and we will see y'all next week. Uh... I'm Stephen Kent and this is why you should never listen to the Reverend and the Reprobate.